bill is absent today. Um, then you want to have to share the So, yeah. using himself on what we'll still have a quorum on all these things. Yes, on credit. Is that the plan? It, it doesn't matter to me, but somebody needs to do it. The attorney needs to do it. Yeah, right. It'll be better. Yeah, I can do that.
Yes, sir. I have mentioned this, but I have a pretty nice old fashioned paper copy of the sounding board. Oh, it's up to date. Yeah. So, in case there's ever a need to refer to any specific section. Nice. Good. So, in addition Perfect. to having it here, but good to know. Thank you. I printed out some various things that were in addition to our zoning packet. I think I got fifty-four one ten in there at the hotel. We got a couple copies of stuff. All right, it's 5.15, so I'm going to call this meeting to order. My name is Jeff Tibbles. I'm the chair of the City of Charleston Board of Zoning Appeals. Um, this is the June 7, 2022 meeting of the City of Charleston Board of Appeals Zoning. Uh, present here today are Allison Grass, Hal Morrison, Robin Richards, John Bennett, Chappie McKay, and me. Um, present from the planning staff are... Lee Batchelder, Penny Ashby, and Omar Muhammad. Um, these proceedings are being recorded, and we ask that those who speak identify yourself for the record, please, when you speak. Uh, we'll conduct this meeting in the usual fashion. We'll first receive information from city staff about the application and their recommendation. If a recommendation is favorable and no one objects to the application, usually the Board of Zoning Appeals treats the matter as being uncontested and passes it as a matter of course. If, however, the city recommends against the application or if there is opposition to the application, we treat the application as contested and then we hear from the applicant and anyone else who is in favor of the application. Next, we hear from anyone opposed, followed by a short rebuttal from the applicant. We then close the public hearing portion of the meeting for that particular application and open discussion to the Board of Zoning Appeals members only. We will then make a decision to approve approve with conditions or deny the application. The Board of Zoning Appeals Zoning has the authority to do three things. One, hear appeals to decisions of the zoning administrator. Number two, grant special exceptions, a fact-finding function of the board. And three, grant variances to the zoning ordinance if the application meets the hardship test outlined in section 54-924 of the ordinance. The board may deliberate and make a final decision on a matter by majority vote of members present at the hearing and qualified to vote, provided that not less than a quorum is present and qualified to vote. However, an affirmative vote of two thirds of the board members present and voting shall be required before a use variance may be granted. For a variance to be granted, the Board of Zoning Appeals must make the following findings. A, that there are extraordinary and exceptional conditions pertaining to the particular piece of property. B, these conditions do not generally apply to other property in the vicinity. C, because of these conditions, the application of the ordinance to the particular piece of property would effectively prohibit or unreasonably restrict the utilization of the property. And D, the authorization of a variance will not be of substantial detriment to adjacent property or to the public good, and the character of the district will not be harmed by the granting of the variance. Um, we're going to, uh, in accordance with the ordinance, anybody who is going to speak, I'm going to do a group swearing in uh, right now. So if you're planning on speaking tonight, please raise your right. Uh, I'm going to ask you, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth you signify by saying I do? I do. Thank you. All right. Uh, we've got a full agenda tonight, so we'll try to work through it as quickly as we can. Um, number one on the agenda is the review of minutes of the May 17, 22, uh, 2022 board meeting. Uh, we've gotten those meetings, uh, those minutes from staff. Does anyone have a motion? Second. All right. Uh, all in favor, please vote by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? 
uh, none opposed, Mr. Morrison uh, and uh, Ms. Richards did not vote because they were not present at the last meeting. Otherwise, it passes unanimously. Uh, item number two on the agenda is 71 King Street, Charleston, Charlestown, 457-16-01-010. Application number 2206-07-A2. Request variance from section 54-301 to allow a one-story covered patio addition with a 48% lot occupancy. 35% limitation, existing lot occupancy, 44%, zoned SR5. Owner is Garrett Nicholas, applicant is Julie Keyes, Fortress Architecture Studio. Mr. Batchelder, you have a presentation on number two. Yeah. Uh, this is a residential property on the corner of King and Trad Street. Just deferred from the last agenda because we didn't have a quorum voting on this matter. So, so um, that's the only reason that was deferred. Uh, here's a map showing that property on the southwest corner of the intersection. This is a aerial view showing the existing residents on the lot. Uh, what's being proposed here is so minor that it almost borders on not being something that really needs to come to the board. So, so minor, so trivial, but technically it is an increase in the lot occupancy, 4% increase in the lot occupancy of the building on the site. So it does technically require your approval. Uh, so what's being requested is a very small addition Plans will show you this, but there's a small rooftop addition that's being a roof addition that's being added in this area to cover an existing patio. So this is the application. Part of the PowerPoint presentation you see in the upper left corner the view of the yard and the existing, um, I guess the south side of the house opposite or south of um, south side of the building that uh, fronts on Trad Street. And what they would like to do is simply add a roof over this section of the patio. So here you see that area shown right here, cross hatched. addition will extend over the patio. And that technically increases the lot occupancy of the building footprint. So uh, that's what is for you tonight. It doesn't really impact any adjoining property owners, so minimal. Uh, it's just the one story extension or addition to that side of the building. And, uh, here is a um, indicates that they've talked to their neighbors and I, I don't believe there's any objections to this. So um, my recommendation is for approval of this request. Thank you, Lee. Um, is there anyone here who's uh, here in opposition to item number two on the agenda for 71 King Street? If you are, just please raise your hand. All right. No opposition. Here from the on this. Right. Uh, unless anybody has specific questions for the applicant. Anybody have any questions? Your motion. Second. Second. Scott. All right. All in uh, favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? No opposed. The motion passes unanimously. The variance is granted for item 271 King Street. Um, you're here. Okay, very. Thank you. All right. Uh, I have to unfortunately recuse myself on item number three, and Mr. Morris or Mr. Bennett is going to act in my stead. I 
Thank you, Mr. Timmons. The following item is agenda item A3. Central Park, uh, TMS number 3400300007, application number 2206-07A3. Request a variance from section 34-1 to allow construction of a single, single family residences that exceeds the two and a half story height restriction for the SR1 single family residential zone district because the homes designed to drive under garage constitutes a third story under section 34-120 zone SR1. Owner, Central Park Road, LLC, applicant, Leesman and Associates, LLC. Mr. Batchelder. This uh, concerns a proposed development that is actually under construction on a tract of land off Central Park Road on James Island. Uh, shown in this location map, um, Central Park Road runs along along this side of the property, the south side of the property. You've got existing neighborhoods that surround three sides of the property, and then some other residential properties up here on Central Park Road also about the property. So um, this has been a, a vacant tract of land, and the uh, applicants have been working through the um, the development review process for several years now to get their approvals to be able to install roads and infrastructure to allow the subdivision of the property into 38 single family residential lots. Uh, the zoning is SR1, and this map shows that zoning as well as the zoning of the property next door. And you see uh, other properties, other lots uh, budding this property that are not shaded in any color. Those are outside the city limits, but they are residentially zoned properties as well. So residential area, and uh, that's the use that is proposed for this property. The development is occurring under um, a provision in the ordinance that was probably adopted around 10 years ago and it's called the cluster um, provisions of the zoning ordinance it allows for the development of single family homes to be uh, modified so that the lot sizes shrink and the homes, the, the area of the residential development um, able to be um, the property is able to be developed in a way that conserves open space and hopefully minimizes the impacts on properties with stormwater runoff and minimizes the cost of infrastructure for the development. So that's the idea behind this. Um, and this has been a like I said, this has been in the works for a number of years now. And, and it's raised concerns because this area of James Island has some flooding issues. And, uh, and so the neighbors who live around this property are rightly concerned about what the impacts might be to them with the development of this property. Uh, city stormwater rules have changed quite a bit over the years and they've become much more stringent and uh, just speaking from experience, I think that uh, they've been improved quite a bit, uh, what they were 10 or 15 years ago. So that has uh, presented more challenges to the developer. And the, the project has gone through a number of iterations uh, from an engineering standpoint to get to the point where it was finally approved for construction. This shows the layout of the of the neighborhood and, and the request that's before you tonight really stems from the fact that this property is um, in an area that is in a flood zone. So it's in a federally designated flood zone where elevation requirements apply to new construction. And 
the requirements concerning flood elevation uh, building requirements have changed over the years, over the period of time that this project has been in the work. So you've had, number one, you've got the um, vertical datum, which is where elevations are measured from. And that's changed. Uh, so it's roughly a foot different today than it was a few years ago, a couple of years ago. The requirements, the federal building, minimum building elevation requirements have changed as well. And new maps were adopted just um, last year. Then on top of that, the city's requirements for additional <coughs> building height above that FEMA designated elevation line have changed over the course of time as well. So that means there's been a lot of changes and it's affected the um, affected how planning for this project evolved over time because um, when you start out with a project, you don't always know what to what the final building pad elevations will end up being. You have to deal with the stormwater drainage and and uh, the minimum elevation requirements that the city has for roads and and pipes that carry that stormwater runoff and. And then you factor in these changes in the building elevation requirements. And so what's happened is that some of the lots, I think probably eight lots out of the 38, would probably qualify to allow for the drive under home, where it's two or two and a half stories of conditioned living space over a, a garage level. Um, I think they would, so roughly eight lots out of these 38 would qualify for uh, the right to do that under our current codes, but the remaining lots are slightly above minimum elevation where we would be able to grant that approval from a staff standpoint. So the developer is asking for your approval for a variance to be able to have those drive under homes, all the lots in this neighborhood. And <clears throat> this is the overall layout. Um, I've added some dimension lines in case any questions come up about the lot sizes, lot widths, lot dimensions. Uh, but you see the access road coming off Central Park and then looping around back here, um, providing access to all the lots. There's open space areas right here. And then there's a large wetland back and open space. Of course, drainage ponds. You've got stormwater drainage that it currently runs through the site. And that will be rerouted re through these uh, ponds over here and, and new pipes to get to the canal that leads out to Long Creek, I think. So, um, a lot going on on this small piece of land. That's a blow up just showing again those dimensions that I've added up here in case anyone has questions, but uh, I'll just point out, so 32 feet wide, this lot is 32 feet wide roughly, this one's 38 feet wide, a little bit wider, about 40 feet wide. So the lots are smaller, like I said, and a normal development in this zoning category, uh, but that opens up opportunities for open space that don't otherwise exist. And, uh, uh, and then the, exactly what the length or the depth of the lots is, but um, about 90 feet, 85 feet. You, this is a photograph of a drive under home that the applicant has constructed in other neighborhoods. I think this is a model, which is why there's landscaping in front of the garage, but, but this would be, you know, the situation where the, the ground level is not intended to be living space. It's just storage and garage space. And then you have the living space. <coughs> and the, 
the issue with this outside of the flood zone area where it's required to meet those codes is that that ground level can be enclosed and become living space and essentially be, be a third story. So that would violate the two and a half story limits that applies to this zoning district and kinds of developments. So that, that's the variance that they're requesting uh, to allow that ground level. And, um, and so my recommendation is gonna be approval we had three conditions, and I've I put these into uh, a document that I know this I'm not trying to understand. <clears throat> so, um I've been talking to the applicant about it. And like I said, this is, the land is just right on the cusp of being able to have these homes without any variances. Um, and some lots do qualify, I think, based on the, the engineering drawings that the city approved for the construction of the neighborhood. And it's under construction as we speak, the, the lots don't exist yet. They haven't been platted, they, the roads haven't been constructed. That's in process. So my recommendation is for approval with the three conditions listed here. The um, applicant proposed this deed restriction uh, language that they would place on the lots um, that says that the Will not convert the ground level underneath the single family residence constructed on the property into a finished living space absent either one express variance granted by the applicable municipal board of zoning appeals allowing such conversion or two revision of the applicable ordinances to allow residences up to three located on the property. This restriction is binding on the grantee as well as the heirs, successors, and the signs of the grantee, grantees, and shall run with the land and title to the property from the due forward. So that would be the deed restriction language. Second would be that the plat that gets recorded creating these lots put a statement that essentially includes the same language. Um, as the deed restriction. And third, that the um, that the um, building permits that are approved by the city to allow construction of the homes also include that condition. And <clears throat> the other thing about this is that um, you know the, the cluster development was intended to uh, promote uh, developments that would be more environmentally sensitive and uh, allow for preservation of trees and uh, minimizing the impacts of uh, stormwater runoff and that sort of thing. And so the idea of doing drive under homes is along those lines because it minimizes the footprint of the house. You don't have to build a, a, a garage addition to the house or a separate building that is the garage for the cars, you just simply utilize the footprint of the, of the proposed house to, to accommodate that. And this is intended to um, preserve that um, drive under home experience for these lots. And, and again, minimize the amount of impervious coverage and uh, that sort of thing. So that's the idea behind this. Um, that's part of the applicant's presentation, which you'll probably hear. And, uh, I think that's worthy in this situation. I know that the surrounding neighbors are very concerned about drainage and you know, the 
flooding impacts from this development. So, so for those reasons, that's why I'm recommending approval of this request with those conditions. Thank you, Mr. Batchelder. So the city's uh, recommendations for approval with the following conditions. Um, for the sake of time, I'm not going to reiterate them as we've already discussed. Um, uh, are there any letters of support or opposition that have not previously been submitted to the board for review? No, we, we sent all of the information that we received, the letters uh, that we received to the board members. So, and those are part of this PowerPoint presentation that listed on, but no, you have everything that we received. Uh, is there anyone present who wishes to speak in opposition? Thank you. You'll have an opportunity in a moment. Um, at this point, we will ask for the applicant to come forward and present. You will have 10 minutes. Please identify yourself and your address as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bennett. Uh, my name is Ellis Leesman. I'm here on behalf of the applicant Central Park Road LLC. My address is 418 King Street in uh, downtown Charleston. Here with me this evening is Robert Collier, the Vice President of Operations uh, for the property owner and also Katie Mullet from yeah. my law firm. I first want to thank Mr. Batchelder and Ms. Ashby for their professionalism and support and assistance in getting this matter forward and, and including the deferral and the assembly of all the materials and the supporting materials. Uh, I've worked particularly closely with, with Mr. Batchelder um, on these deep restrictions and other things to resolve some concerns. Um, Lee gave a very thorough explanation to the board, and so I'll try not to repeat the matters that he has already covered. Again, the purpose of this variance is to allow for additional crawl space. Basically, rather than limiting that crawl space to just six feet, allowing that crawl space to be eight, nine to 10 feet so that cars can be parked underneath it, canoes and paddle boards and things can be used so that a separate garage building is not necessary. It is not, ladies and gentlemen, to ask for the buildings to be taller. High restriction still remains. It is not to ask for three-story houses. Again, the crawl space underneath the house is not a story. Again, there's an issue with the wording of the, of the ordinance, but again, it's, it's an area underneath the house. There's no living room, dining room, bedroom, bathroom, or anything of the like there. Purpose, again, is consistent with the cluster development zoning under which this project was, was approved. As Mr. Batchelder mentioned, this process began in 2017. Several things have changed since then. One, the city has modified its cluster zoning. Secondly, the city has modified its ordinances so that in an area that, of a crawl space that's more than six feet now counts as a story, even though no one's living there. Also, the city adopted an exception, which indicates that if you are within a foot and a half, if the, if the finished floor elevation will be within a foot and a half of the base flood elevation, and you're in a certain zoning district, including SR1, that you would qualify. So under the FEMA flood maps that existed up until January of 2021, this project fully qualified because that base flood elevation was 12 feet. If you add a foot and a half onto that, that's 13 and a half feet. And the finished elevation of all of these lots was less than that. Subsequently, the FEMA map that was adopted in January of 2021 changed that to 10 feet. So by that two feet of decrease, now 30 of these lots that otherwise qualified up until January of 2021, now are inches, really a matter of between four, six or eight inches, slightly too tall to otherwise qualify as a matter of right. So those are some of the examples and I'll get to the variance test in just a moment. But what I did want to talk about is the importance of elevation. You've all heard of the Dutch dialogues. Some of you may have participated in some of those meetings and gone to it. On page 50, 38 of the, of the final report of the Dutch dialogues, it says the following quote, which is a, a Cajun saying, elevation is salvation from inundation. That elevation is critical in low-lying places and awareness of place translates to informed action. Again, Resilience and sustainability of homes are assisted if they are elevated slightly further off the ground. A patio home or a slab home is less resilient to flooding than one that's elevated six, eight, ten feet. 
There are several other places in the Dutch dialogues on page 59, 80, and 113, where the idea of elevating your construction, and thank you Link, for showing those from the final report. It, it, this very technique is encouraged. This board has approved other variances, and you've also seen in driving around your city, you've seen several examples of elevated homes that, that, that take advantage of this building technique. Within your packet, we've also submitted a, a statement of engineering support from Seaman Whiteside and Dr. Hassad Ishmael, who gave uh, detail about how this particular uh, technique on this particular property is appropriate. So again, real quickly to speak about the four prong variance test. First, we would need to show that there are extraordinary and exceptional conditions relating to this property. First, the ordinance changed with regard to the definition of what constitutes a story after this project was approved. The FEMA maps changed, changing the flood elevation by two feet after this project was approved. This project is approved as a cluster development, which is also unique. This area is designated by FEMA as a special flood hazard area and by the city as a special protection area. So what that means, it doesn't mean that building is inappropriate. It's still zoned residentially. This project is still approved. It's been through with Mr. Fountain and Mr. Holton, probably the most rigorous stormwater analysis of any project within this of, of similar size and character within the city of Charleston. I can promise you that I've been involved with that now for four years. But what that has done is it's resulted in a land plan that has 1.4 acres of ponds, which is unlike other areas, which were designed at a time before ponds were even required. It has 2.4 acres of open space and it has 3.17 acres of passive open space, all on us, that's total 6.9 acres on a, on a project that's slightly over 10. So 6.9 acres are already open space of one kind or another, or our ponds. So when you have that limited amount of building space available, it's important to use it efficiently. This design uses it efficiently, as Mr. Batfelder said, by eliminating the need for a separate garage. It also reduces the impervious surface by minimizing driveway and that there's not a separate building. And again, it will also fit within the existing requirements uh, of the SR1 zoning. Those conditions I've mentioned don't apply to other properties. If I were to try to find another property in the area that was, had those changes occur to the, the zoning ordinance, to the flood map, that was a cluster development, that had those slight variations in topography, there was a special protection area that required all of the additional uh, infrastructure and, and flood protection that's gonna benefit all these surrounding neighborhoods. There wouldn't be another property that we could identify. Uh, that would meet all of those extraordinary and exceptional conditions. So due to those conditions, it would unreasonably restrict the utilization of this property for this ordinance not to be allowed. As Mr. Batchelder explained, we're a matter of inches from being able to do this as a matter of right. Intervening changes would basically result in only one and a half story houses being allowed to be built rather than two, two story houses, which would be an unreasonable restriction. Uh, the configuration of the lots, again, with the, with the idea of a, of a uh, cluster development in mind, they're smaller, which, which requires this greater efficiency. Uh, some already qualify, and so uh, refusing that de minimis extension to the other lots, I believe, would also be an unreasonable restriction. And then lastly, if you were to authorize this variance, it would not result in a substantial detriment to the adjacent property of the public good. As, as Lee mentioned, there are some, uh, some voices of opposition. You'll hear from them tonight. Those voices of opposition, I don't think are gonna specifically be about whether the crawl space should be six feet, eight feet, or 10 feet. There's folks that just oppose the development as a whole. There's folks in Charleston that oppose, oppose any development whatsoever on James Island. Those voices are, are honest, they're heartfelt. They're not illegitimate but they don't speak to the issue that's before the board, which is, should we allow this technique to be utilized? It's a matter of inches away from being a, a, a right on part of this applicant. When actually what would happen by granting the variance, you'd reduce the footprint, you allow for less concrete, you eliminate the need for on-street parking, you'd eliminate there being multiple buildings, which likely would be converted into ADUs. And through what Lee has negotiated uh, through our interactions, you've obtained a deed restriction. 
so that the owner is binding not just themselves, but all subsequent owners of this property, that that will never be converted. That's a right that other people have on other projects and other developments, but that's a right that will be surrendered on this project. And not just that right, but also a condition that when this these houses would be built, that only one structure would be built, not multiple structures, which resolves the concerns you might hear about height and density. Again, we're not asking to exceed the requirement as it exists. So we have letters of support from families that have been in this neighborhood for decades, the Seabrooks and the Pinckney's, um, and again, if you if you drill down and look at the at the issue, you'll realize that the the project with the infrastructure, with the additional ponds, with the reduction in impervious surface and the restriction of one building per lot, actually accommodates the concerns that have been given to you or will be given to you in opposition to this variance being granted. So I thank you for your time and cons consideration. On behalf of the applicant, I would uh, respectfully request the variance be granted. Thank you. Um, is there anybody else here who wishes to speak on behalf of the application? Hearing none, um, will those who wish to speak in opposition please step forward? Thank you. Will you state your name and your address? My name is Carol Green. My address is 416 East Wimbledon High. My property is adjacent to uh, We're on the opposite side of the East Wimbledon Canal, where all of this property drains into. Uh, I am here in opposition. I understand that the new verbiage and the deed restriction, I'll stick to my notes so I will, uh, um, does actually pretty much preclude uh, the accessory dwelling units from being located on the ground floor. Um, however, as stated, it does allow the owner to come back later on and come right back to you where you are right now and ask for a variance to have that ADU on the ground floor, even though it's prevented right now, as if it goes through as, as it's worded right now. That owner can come back, however, in the future and ask for that variance for the ground floor. So I think you're off to a good start in that deed restriction, but it's just not there yet. So to prevent that from happening, I think it needs to have stronger wording in there. So it, it's a good start, but I just think it's not there yet. Um, or they could change you know, to allow three stories, possibly if the ordinance was changed to allow three stories in the SR1 zoning. That's not gonna help us either. Um, the other thing is, the owner of the property could just create the ADU, the accessory dwelling unit, on the top floor, leave the bottom. Someone in the neighborhood next to us did that. And they have out exterior stairs. So their top half floor, which was like a half floor, wasn't a full story, that's their ADU. And they have exterior stairs coming down. So they still have their parking underneath and they have their one story and they have their ADU on top with exterior stairs. So still again, to prevent the ADU, the verbiage isn't there. Um, one, you know, you think of preventing the ADUs because you're talking about, this is proposed as a 38 single family homes. 30 a single family. An ADU, that is not what you're going to get. So you're either going to get a mom with a couple kids or just a single person or a couple. That means extra cars, got to have a place to park them. So if you have that nice driveway with that parking underneath, it's not going to accommodate extra cars for whoever lives in that ADU. So you're going to have to have an extra parking pad, which is going to increase the impervious surface, which is going to increase the drainage for the runoff. And what if all 38 of those lots did that? That throws off all of the engineering that has been done for this project. 
none of that drainage, none of those numbers work anymore. So you're back to Matt and everybody else and all these years of work that they've done. Because none of those numbers work anymore. And that is Wimbledon Canal. Still, it's full of the gills, and overflowing on high tide, especially these king tides. And I have the pictures, if you do see them, they're on my phone, that still overflow without any rainfall into our backyards. So when you increase more than what the engineers have already come up with in the numbers, because you're going to add things to it, if any ADUs are allowed in this single family proposal of 38 lots, again, what the gentleman, did you read it? Whoever read the beginning information, or was that gentleman that accused no, himself? Really, uh, really. So in the beginning, it said, whoever read the introductory information that was sitting over there said, should not be a detriment to the adjacent property. If there's no verbiage in the deed restriction that says there should, will not be any accessory dwelling units allowed, period. End of story. Then, whatever the engineers have come up with for the drainage, it might work. Yes, as an adjacent property owner, who gets flooded all the time from just high tide? And when it rains, it comes halfway up or all the way up to my house. I am concerned because we heard this from Fleming Park and we get more water and we get flooded more water from them. So. I'm sorry, I, I do, I doubt it. So, you know, all I can do is say I hope the engineers are right this time. So I, I am asking, I am, I am opposing it. Um, and all I can say is maybe go back to the drawing board with the verbiage in the restriction for no accessory dwelling units. And also think of the, the increased density. Um, also, I'm a newly retired teacher. Think of what if all 38 of those had a, a mom or dad move in there with a kid or two? Think of what you're doing to the home school. You got one or two extra classrooms immediately. Guess what? My classroom is overcrowded. It's not fun. You're there to teach. You're not there for crowd control. I was a doggone good teacher. But doggone, you know, when you've got 30 bodies, you know, it's a lot of behavior control, too. So please, it's not just, you know, that one little decision, it affects lots of other things. It just keeps, there are lots and lots of other things. It, it just keeps going. So please, I, yes, I am in opposition. I do thank you for your time. Very much. Is there anyone else here who wishes to speak in opposition? I do. Um, I'm Carol Jackson, I'm James Island, 1460. Um, I'm one of the residents of James Island that has been following this project since its inception. I think it was um, probably mid-year 2017. Um, and there, I really appreciate what Mr. Batchelder's description of all of the changes that have gone on over the years regulations, um, as well as just the um, studied impacts that we all know are now um, our life um, going forward in the, the change to the climate and how it in, impacts our sea levels and tidal creek. And that area of Central Park Basin has been studied over the, the intervening years to know that we have a lot of um, challenges with managing water, that part of James Island in particular. So, um, so Mr. Batchelder is absolutely right when he says that much has changed and that there is a lot going on on a little piece of land uh, that's being asked, um, put, put on before you to ask for variances to the um, crawl space ordinance that was designed to protect the, the, the height and the flooding. And I think uh, one of the things I just, thought about, as, as Mr. Batchelder was saying, that much has changed over the last many years. One thing that hasn't changed is the developer's determination 
to build as close to the amount of um, by right number of <coughs> uh, units for a 10 acre property. So that, that, that has been a hard and fast goal of, um, of uh, Mr. Lesson's employer. And I appreciate that you know, land comes with uh, terms that require and allow uh, the highest and best use according to the zoning on which a property um, sits. This, this property was designated a cluster overlay development. Uh, it's one of a handful that actually have been built out or will be built out under that cluster designation. One of the things that changed over the intervening years was the city realized that the cluster properties that were being um, uh, uh, entitled are actually too small to entertain this kind of cluster build out. And you can see by the diagram that's still up on the screen in front. You know, literally how much is on that, that really tight site with a lot of wetlands and natural features that the neighbors who've lived on either side of the 10 acres, you know, for the last decades, say is the natural basin, the drainage basin for, for all of those um, neighborhoods that were there from probably the 50s going forward. So there's a lot of moving parts here. And um, I, I do know that the neighborhood in particular has had, you know, a, a lot of uh, pent up expectation that the city would control um, the, the size of the property build out based on the flood um, studies that have been um, taking place over these years. Regardless, um, the current stormwater permit has been given for the 38 units that are on the drawing before you. And I, I just wanted to say uh, basically two points in detail about what I understand of the variance request in front of you, as well as the existing um, uh, components of the, of the plan that will be going forward to build out if you give them the variance tonight. I don't think it's, um, it's really relevant to talk about the option for not giving this variance for the, for the crawl space height um, would, would then immediately lead to separate garage footprint being built with extra pervious, uh, impervious services. My understanding is that the current stormwater management design permit is based on a, a conservative percentage of lot coverage, and that number ranges between 60 percent for each one of those lots and and just as a off the top um, estimate another engineer who's worked on this project said that to put a separate garage footprint with the extra driveway that would be required would be easily a 70 percent flat coverage if not if not more so i don't think there's really that concern um, that the Turn into a revision of the stormwater management plan, as uh, as the owner's representative said. This was probably one of the most lengthy and um, high level scrutinies of stormwater design that the city have ever undertaken in, in recent memory. Um, the other point that I just really wanted to communicate because maybe I'm missing something, but the way that I read the or that they're, that they're um, stating it should be given the exclusion to the um, section 504, 505, whatever it is, um, item E, 54-505, item E, um, says that that, that that increase in crawl space height can be given as an exception if the overall height limit of the property itself will not exceed the maximum for the zoning. The way I understand SR1 height limit zoning is that it's 35 feet. In the models that the applicant um, put in his presentation tonight, each one of those models is, is um, demonstrated to have 35 feet plus. I think one's 35 and something, the other two are over 36 feet. So I don't really understand uh, that detail and how that would then lead these um, properties to be within the confines of granting that exception under the city's 2021 ordinance. 
controls the crawl space height. So thank you very much for being here. We really appreciate all your work to the city. Uh, is there anyone else here in opposition? Okay. Um, this uh, is now an opportunity for the applicant to rebut. Um, in the interest of fairness, they received a few extra minutes, so I'll offer you the same. Uh, if you'd like, instead of three minutes, you may have up to six. Oh, well, I appreciate that, Mr. Mayor. I'd be great if y'all got other items on your agenda tonight. Um, <laughs> so one thing I, I wanted you to know is that, you know, as far as, as the uh, additional dwelling units, um, there's no request for those here. Uh, and the city, I think, is, is uh, I just watched a YouTube video last week of Mayor Tecklenburg encouraging uh, ADUs and asking people to go seek them. So I don't, you know, I don't really think that that's something that really needs to be dealt into this discussion because, again, we're asking for a additional crawl space height, crawl space height uh, of, of eight to ten feet um, with a restriction that an auxiliary or an additional dwelling unit would, would not be allowed. We're agreeing to a deed restriction that's not applicable to other properties in the city of Charleston. That they, even the mayor is encouraging folks to go uh, seek ADUs if they'd like. There'll be covenants. Um, Ms. Green brought up an example of an existing neighborhood where somebody sort of bolted on a staircase on the outside of their, their house and, and um, kind of created an ADU maybe in the attic or something like that. Um, you know, I live in Creekside in Mount Pleasant. It's an older neighborhood. It doesn't have a lot of strict restrictions. A lot of the neighborhoods on James Allen or in West Elster are like that too. This is a new neighborhood that's going to have a set of covenants that we're not built. That's just, those types of things are not a concern in this in this neighborhood. Um, the, the hypothetical about uh, you know, allowing ADUs again, I think, is, is something that we don't really need to think about because again, we've got the deed restriction that's here uh, to prevent that. And you know, I think it's important to allow, as far as the wording, the deed restriction itself. There could be a change of circumstances, and, and limitations on property rights should be uh, should be judicious and, and should be limited. So that if there is a change of, 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 of conditions that we're to convince this board and convince Mr. Batchelder or your successors or his successor that perhaps they should change that or if the ordinance changes, well, these property owners should not be um, deprived uh, of, of their right with a project that's a cluster that's been approved by DHEC, by OCR, OCR <laughs> by the city, by the county, by the James Island Public Service District every applicable municipality through a four and a half year process. In fact, this map is not exactly accurate because there are no longer seven lots here. There's only five because this additional space was devoted to more stormwater. The concerns about the canal, in order to get this project through approval under the special protection area requirements, this project had to prove that it reduces the flow of stormwater by 50% from what the existing conditions are. And the way that you achieve that is by giving up more of your property to achieve both these wet ponds plus dry ponds that are on the approved preliminary plat that was passed in January of 2021. So ultimately, this project presents relief for stormwater issues that have been presented because <clears throat> if you go all through Laurel Park and all through Marlboro, you won't see all of these features that are designed for the very purpose of retaining and detaining stormwater. Those are, those are additions that the city has very carefully monitored, modeled, and proven will actually improve the conditions. So again, came before you with a simple request, which I hope that you can grant, which is that under these circumstances, the ability to build and to take advantage of this resilient technique of elevating the home slightly, reducing on-street parking, reducing driveways, reducing separate garages, all of those for all the reasons that would qualify for a variance under the four-part test, and would respectfully request that you would grant. Thank you, Mr. Leeson. We'll now close the public portion and open for board discussion. If there are any questions, the applicants. Um, so, Elder, you mentioned that the property is already under development. Has it been cleared? Um, what what state is it in? I'm uh, not sure exactly how far along they are in the process, but they've received the per permits from the city to actually construct the roads and the infrastructure and do the grading so that they can then uh, record a final plat that 
creates all these lots and start vertical construction of the homes. So they're in the process of moving forward. I'm sorry. It has been cleared. Um, the letter that we received, the board received from the um, neighborhood president of Marlboro, is that correct? The Marlboro right. Neighborhood Association. Um, their concerns were also the same that we've heard, the ADUs and then the flooding. Is that what her letter addressed? I'm sorry, I, don't, I didn't bring it, a copy, but. I think it's in here and I think that's correct. I think that's what she best Oops. Yeah, no, that's that's a slide. Yeah. This was the first one from May, previously on the agenda, and then this is the latest one. And Mr. Batchelder, you feel like the design addresses the flooding issue? I know we have two different things we're talking about, but I guess the reason I asked if it was clear too, because I know they've, they've referenced the Dutch dialogues and I mean, a huge component of that is, you know, conserving the trees so that they naturally absorb the storm water. Um, and if it's cleared, I'm just wondering, now they have the ponds, well, they do, do they do have some trees that they have to preserve on site and then there are the new ponds that are going to be installed and all the grading that will be done as part of the. And then what drain what actually drains into the Wimbledon Creek. Well, I don't, I mean, I can speak <coughs> maybe very generally about how this works, but. So I think the water is coming through the neighborhood over here, through these ponds and into the canal, which runs right here. And you see this pond back here has a it has an overflow that goes into that canal as well. So Eventually, the water is working its way down the Central Park Road, under Central Park Road, into side. So that's the general flow of water, I believe. And but I'm not really an engineer. I'm not an engineer. I don't Thank you. work with those issues. Yeah. The portion is closed. Thank you. Unless there's a question addressed to you. Mr. Manchel, what is the city's interest in allowing for future express variants granted to permit an ADU? Why would the city want to invite, after this is built out, applicants to come back in here and convert the bottom floor into a separate residence? I don't, I think this is discouraging the, the condition that I've recommended that the applicant is able to would would not allow the ground floor to be converted to an ADU. That wouldn't stop somebody from adding an ADU in the house, but then the condition house, it wouldn't necessarily stop somebody from coming in and proposing a separate building or an addition or well it'd be a separate building uh, on the lot that would become an ADU. Uh, but it would the condition that I've recommended would not permit the ground level of the building, this elevated crawl space, to become an ADU. Except with an express variance, isn't that what right? The express variance, which I would not be so supportive of, and it would have to get your that's approval. us. That's I mean, you. It, it looks like an open invitation immediately. Okay, I mean, yeah, for them to come in and and once one person. 38 building development with identical buildings is granted variance. 
how are we to deny a variance to anybody after the first one? Ain't it? Well, so, you know, what you could do is remove item number one. I mean, that, that would be that mean my instinctive response to this. I'm, I'm sympathetic to the developer in a way with all these changes that have happened in the regulatory environment since they started this project, although I don't know why it's taken years just to get the vertical infrastructure in, but uh, that, that's a developer asking for, for this kind of seems to have the effect of essentially deferring that question to a future board. Yeah. Which we, might then set precedent. Which we might be like on the future board. True, yeah. but the time, <laughs> it seems like the question is right, and now is the time to address that, that issue uh, as it's before the board. I just deferring it essentially. It kicks a can. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, the way it's written. Yeah. I agree. Well, I don't, I mean, I don't, I think that's attenuated argument. I agree with Mr. Leesman on that, that covenants and restrictions are probably going to impede that. Uh, but that's up to people to write, you know, write those things. But, and I don't think we as a board can assume that developers are building these with an intention to, to make the project more dense than they've applied for. And the people who are, and all the people who are buying these places will be interested in adding an extra resident. I think that's unlikely. Uh, you know, absent grown up children who don't have jobs or something. But it just, this first the way, this first uh, inception. Condition is written, it does worry me. I'd like to see it. I'd like to see it gone. And even if it's gone, even if it's uh, denied or, or deleted, people are still going to have the right to come apply to this board anyway. But it, this seems to invite the, uh, the application, which worries me. I have one question. Limit of 35 feet. Yes, so there are some diagrams that are in for illustrative purposes. Again, to get a building permit from the city, we will not be able to exceed the height limitation and will not exceed the height limitation. So that's that's clear. You know, that's that's a separate that's a separate variance, but the, the design works. If the if the crawl space is allowed. And if I might just take this accommodation to address Mr. Uh, Morris's point, um, we worked with the city on this deed restriction language, and the the owner would accept the if there is if there were to be a motion that would propose a modification to that condition, the owner would not object to that modification if that at all helps the board with its deliberations. Thank, Thank you, sir. Aspects of that. Uh, of these conditions you're concerned about or you have questions about as to the number three condition mr batchelder uh, applicants should only build a single elevated residential structure when the lot is first built upon why is that last phrase in there lot is first built upon. that was um a response to a request by me from the applicant. So uh, I requested modifications and the applicant came back with that suggestion as to what they would be willing to do. And so I just felt that was, that was. Uh, All these lots when they're first built upon are going to be according to this uh, architect approved architectural plan that you showed us the exemplar of, right? Well, you have a lot of flexibility in this 
type of development. There are no building setback requirements on these lots. There are building code requirements that pretty much dictate that you're not gonna build right up to the property lines, but um, you have a lot of flexibility what you do on these lots. So um, I don't know what the what will actually be proposed in terms of the construction on the lots, but um, this would imply that they're just gonna build one single elevated home on each lot to begin with. And that's, I felt like that was a, a good- So it was a big hurricane and they all get swept away when you start over. <laughs> okay. All right, I understand that. Thank you. To to that same question, that does not place any sort of restriction on future garages or dwelling units based on the same lot, correct? So there could be a future construction um, provided it still meets the same uh, requirements of the building code for uh, distance relative to neighbors, that sort of thing. Um, it seems to me that that is, uh, your point is only a restriction at the time that this building would be approved, not. Appropriate if there are no more comments. Are y'all all comfortable with the flooding issue? I'm just, I'm not comfortable yet. But I, I don't see how these changes affect the flooding question. I do have one question though with regard to, and this is a question that's popped up on a similar topic with the ground level being located within a flood zone. Um, what are, and you may not be able to answer this question, but what are the, um, uh, there are eight buildings that are being constructed that are within the AE zone. Are the uh, are those lowest levels being built uh, uh, to the same flood proof, flood, flood proof requirements, excuse me, um, that are in the building code? And will that apply to all 38 buildings or will it be only the eight that are actually within a flood zone? And so I, what I mean by that is um, it seems like there's some concern about future flooding and my question is, will you, will these buildings be built uh, with floodproof construction at the, at only the eight that are in the flood zone or will all of the buildings be up to the same standard? They would all be up to the same standard and Mr. Collier is here and maybe could speak to that. Um, so that the, the, the issue about the eight is that due to some slight topographical changes, those lots are still low enough to where they quantify automatically, so there will be no variance that was needed. These others are three inches, four inches, five inches, six inches taller when they're finished. And so that's the reason why that is required, but all of the construction would, would meet with all, all of the requirements that National Building Code that's applicable. And they, they, there would be no distinction between the eight and the 30 lots on that basis. Okay. Um, Grass, if, if, I, if I could just briefly speak to the issue that you brought up. Again, I know Kinsey now on a first name basis. I know Matt on a first name basis. This project went through a DHEC special review, a DHEC technical review. The reason Mr. Morrison, it took so long, it was designated as a special protection area after the concept plan was already approved. So the need to require the most stringent requirements that the city has for a project were imposed after the project was already in the design review process. And so you've had really more than 10 engineers that have looked at that between the city, the county, DHEC, Seaman Whiteside, and all, all of those folks. And so it has passed all of those permits and, and, and all of those requirements have been met. And I'm not sure how many other projects have actually ever gone through and completed those special protection area requirements, which specifically require that additional storage, and also that you reduce the flow. So water is essentially being, that, that isn't currently being held on this property, is going to be held and detained on this property so it's reduced at a lower rate going forward so that it's actually an improvement to what is, what is happening. There are other infrastructure improvements on James Island as a whole that the city would pursue. But again, on this project, they really could not be asked no, no more could be asked of this project that's being provided because it's meeting those most high requirements that the city has for
for residential project. And I, I know that you have a legitimate concern. It's one that's been very, very carefully about it uh, through the entire process. And, and Mr. Morrison, and briefly, and I'll sit back down. The issue with the one building versus the two buildings was exactly for the reason that you stated at the end, which is if a building was destroyed, if the home was destroyed, and the, and the owner then came back, that they wouldn't, they just would have the same rights that another property owner on James Island would have to come back and to do something that meets all the requirements that could have two buildings that they wanted to. I would actually, yeah, if you don't mind. Yeah. Sure. Um, yes, the, I mean, it's in the very nature of that, that form of construction, the elevated uh, approach is by its very nature. The, the flood proof approach, if you will, the masonry and the elevation well out of both flood and, and freeboard. Um, so most certainly they'll be built to the same standards. Um, and, and can't help but mention too, you know, without that ground floor being constructed that way, we would have to build elevated slab um, construction, meaning we would import fill to the site, which creates more displacement of flood water. Really, alleviating more of a problem by doing the flood construction and the open foundation that the water can flow through. Um, yeah, I believe it does. Yeah, my question is primarily about materials and use of flood proof materials at the greater sure. ground level. Sure. And, you know, all the, all the properties are going to be built in the flood zone and have to comply with the NFIP, National Flood sure. Insurance Program. So they'll have a FEMA requirements for storm water gates and everything like that. So that's into the code. So should, that should come up. And then as to the flooding, the you know post about the stormwater requirements, your calculations to get to the city of Charleston where we are currently. Staff has probably worked pretty hard with y'all and your site and civil engineers to make sure that the post on water runoff less than it was before. So now your requirements. You can't get your permit. Hopefully or not, but all of it is. Thank you. <laughs> I like your I like your suggested change. Any more questions or comments? I, if I may, I, I'd move to approve with the adoption of the city's conditions that we've been presented with with the deletion. Uh, Romanet one in both paragraphs, numbers one and two. Did you want to select that little bit in number three, two? No, I'm all right with that. Okay. Uh, I think that gives the buyers the rights to come back and exercise freedoms to come back to us in the future, but it doesn't. As you were saying earlier, it just doesn't. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't. It, it, it's uh, it would be odd for us to try to bind future boards in the event of something unpredictable happening in the future, I, they can deal with that. There's a motion for approval with conditions uh, striking the text either I, I and express variance granted by the applicable municipal board of zoning appeals allowing such conversions or, and then in part two, striking the same language as well. Uh, is there a second? All those in favor? Okay. All those opposed? The motion is unanimously approved with the conditions as noted. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Mr. Bennett, for your able chairmanship on uh, agenda item A3. Um, we're now moving to section B of the agenda, new applications. Uh, B1 is 1 through 11 Ashley Boulevard in Charlestown, TMS number 457-11-01-039, requesting a three 
third one year extension of a vested right that expires on June 5th, 2022, pursuant to section 54 962. Vested right is an approved variance under section 54 353 for attached dwelling units, duplexes in a STR single two family residential zone district. The owner is Barnes Moultrie Ward, LLC. The applicant is Neil Stevenson Architects and Tara Romano. Uh, so Mr. Batchelder can talk to me about that. So this is the extension of the vested right and nothing has changed with the ordinance that would preclude the, the uh, approval of this extension by the board. And uh, so we recommend that the board grant the extension. All right. Um, is anyone here in opposition to item B1 on tonight's agenda? All right. I don't see anyone in opposition. Um, we don't need to hear from the applicant unless any member of the board has a question for the applicant or staff. I do have one brief question, Mr. Batchelder. Um, it, it, the vested right uh, was stated to expire on June 5th, 2022. Um, the application, I assume, is the uh, determinative date for that. Right. The application was filed approximately a month ago, so it, we accept that. Met the deadline. Okay. All right. Uh, any motion? Okay. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion passes unanimously. The uh, third one year extension of the vested right is approved. Uh, so we're on to the next item. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Um, item B2 Pavement Avenue on the west side, TMS number 460. 00-00-017 requests the third one-year extension of a vested right that expires on July 17, 2022, pursuant to section 54-962. Vested right pertains to a special exception granted under section 54-220 on July 17, 2018, with conditions for a 250-unit accommodations use in an MU2 slash WH mixed use to workforce housing zone district. Owner is South Park Ventures LLC, applicant Womble Blonde Dickinson, uh, James Wilson, and Mr. Batchel. This application was approved to allow the construction of the hotel at this location, uh, just north of Spring Street. To Pagan Avenue. Uh, nothing, again, nothing has changed with the ordinance that would include the approval of this uh, extension, and we recommend the board approve it. All right, is anyone here in opposition to item B2 on tonight's agenda? I see no one uh, in opposition. Uh, any questions for the applicant or staff? I'm hearing none. Do I hear a motion? Second. Second. Um, all right. Uh, any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, the, Mr. Tibbles. Yes. That is approval with conditions, correct? Yes, it is the approved with conditions um, as, as it is. Um, Are the conditions on the agenda? Well, I would Bishop? say that that's not really uh, necessary to even mention because the extent you're approving the extension of the original approval, which had the conditions attached to it. So okay. I, I wouldn't get it too far into that. Okay. So what we're what we're doing here, just in in uh, for full clarity, is we're uh, approving the we did approve the extension of a vested right that vested right included conditions and so by uh, allowing the extension of that the prior approval 
um, moves forward extended uh, just as it was approved with conditions originally. Uh, Mr. Wilson, thank you. I asked Mr. Batchelder if I could consider all of these together, uh, and um, I was told no. <laughs> um, all right, item B3 on the agenda, 411 Meeting Street, Canberra, Elliottboro, TMS 459-09-03-115. Request the fifth one-year extension of a vested right that expires on December 31, 2022, pursuant to section 54-962. Vested right pertains to a special exception granted under section 54-220 on June 7, 2016, with conditions for a 300 unit accommodations use in an MU mixed use zone district. Owner Bennett Meeting Street LLC, applicant Womble Bond Dickinson, uh, James Wilson, Mr. Batchelder. You want to do just read all of them in the record? I'd be I'd be happy to do that. Sure. Okay. Uh, the, uh, well, here's my only concern with that. We did have a recusal apparently oh, on that's true on um, on one of them. So why don't we just we we'll just knock them out one at a time? Okay. So this is. Um, Another hotel on 411 Meeting Street approved uh, several years ago, and we recommend approval of this. All right, anyone here in opposition to agenda item uh, B3? I see no one in opposition here tonight. Uh, any questions? All right, do I hear a motion? All right, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? The ayes have it. The motion passes. The vested right is extended uh, on uh, 411 Meeting Street, agenda item B3. The next agenda item is B4, 317 Savannah Highway, TMS number 421-07-00-003. Request the fifth one-year extension of a vested right that expires on December 4th, 2022, pursuant to section 54-962. Vested right pertains to a special exception granted under section 54-220 on December 4, 2007, for a 150-unit accommodations use in a GBA, General Business Accommodations Zone District. Owner is Riverview Ventures, LLC, applicant Womble Bond Dickinson, James Wilson. Uh, with your permission, Lee, I will go ahead and yes. uh, take care of five. Five is uh, two, uh, agenda item uh, B5, 246 Springs Street, West Side, TMS number 460-10-02-00-0001. Request the fifth one-year extension of a vested right that expires on December 31, 2022, pursuant to section 54-962. Vested right pertains to a special <coughs> exception granted under section 54-220 on December 18, 2012, for a 125-unit accommodations use in an MU slash WH mixed use to Workforce Housing Zone District. At owner is Spring Street Ventures, LLC. Applicant, Womble Bond Dickinson, James Wilson. Is there anyone here who is uh, in opposition to agenda items B4 or B5? No one in opposition to B4 or B5. Mr. Batchelder, you want to describe these? Uh, there are two more hotel developments that were approved by the board several years ago, and these are uh, both projects where the rules have not changed, the board zoning rules have not changed that include the extension. So my recommendation is for approval. All right. Any questions for the applicant? Any questions for the staff? Your motion. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. 
the eyes have it unanimously. The um, request for the extensions on items B4 and B5 are granted unanimously. Uh, item B6 on the agenda, 56 State Street, PMS number 458-05-03-108. Request special exception under section 54-220 to allow a 50 unit accommodations use in a GBA, General Business Accommodations Zone District. Owner is East Bay Company Limited. Applicant is Wombleban Dickinson. James Wilson, Mr. Batchel. So 56 State Street is a corner property in a French Corner neighborhood and uh, mm -hmm. located on the northeast corner of Cumberland and State Street. It's uh, zone general business. And it is within the accommodations overlay zone. So the red on this map zoning map indicates the general business zoning for that area and the cross hatching which you can see if you look closely on the map indicates the extent of the accommodations overlay zone where hotel developments are permiss permissible with the approval of a special exception from the board of zoning appeals so that is the request that's before you tonight. The request to build this accommodation is on this property. Um, this is an aerial view. It is presently occupied by a one story commercial building and surface parking lot. And uh, I'll show you some more photographs. So, this is a great view uh, of the front of the building looking from the intersection of Cumberland and State. And, uh, the building's been there for a long time. I guess it was originally a gas station and, uh, and then was converted many years ago to this convenience store with a small uh, commercial space on the left side of this image that um, I guess was most recently occupied by a little breakfast restaurant. So not a very attractive use for that neighborhood. And uh, although a convenient use for people, but not uh, the type of building that the city uh, would like to see in this location. Uh, height district allows for, I think, a three and a half story building up to four with the VAR's approval, I believe. Um, oh, a four story building. Oops. So that there's a four story height limit on the building. Um, and if you look at surrounding buildings, that's pretty typical of what you have on the north side of Cumberland Street right there. So this map is uh, meant to illustrate uh, very clearly the extent of the accommodations overlay zone. And so I want to make a couple points. Number one, it's within the accommodations overlay zone. That entire block that that property is part of is within that zone. Block to the south, which is abandoned by Lodge Alley on the south, Cumberland on the, on the north, East Bay, and State Street. That is within the accommodations overlay zone. That's the location of Lodge Alley, which is an accommodations use. I'll go into that in a little more detail. Uh, but if you go Caddy Corner and you look at the commercially zoned property at State and Cumberland on the west side of State, that is not within the accommodations overlay zone. It's an office building. And if you look directly across State Street, you see um, this property along Cumberland Street, the north side of Cumberland Street from State to Church. That also is no longer in the accommodations overlay zone. That property had been approved for an accommodations use roughly uh, five, six years ago, and uh, the owner of that property was never able to move forward for whatever reason with the development of that property. I know it was uh, on the market for a while. No buyers came forward that wanted to do the hotel, but a buyer did come forward who was interested in building residential on that property. So 
it has been sold. I believe it's been closed, and uh, that that buyer requested a, a rezoning of the property to enable more residential density on the property. At the same time, at the request of the city, they uh, voluntarily removed or requested the removal of the accommodations overlay zone from that property, and that's all of these properties that are shown here uh, without the accommodations overlay zone, those are, those are properties that were recently rezoned to allow that residential development to occur. And the, so the hotel development that was slated for that property uh, will not, not occur. It's been removed from that use. So that's, I think, a very good thing personally, because, um, and I think the city was very favorable towards that too, because we kind of like to see mixture of uses on that block and a um, and residential edge to that side of Cumberland Street, because that is the north side of, of uh, the French Quarter neighborhood residential area right there. So, so I think that's a good thing. Uh, then another point that I'll make with this map um, is that the zoning ordinance, and I just want to hit a few high points before I get into the, the uh, specific requirements of the hotel, but um, this, this map is meant to illustrate the approximate distance of 500 feet measured from the property in question. And uh, so the board is, uh, is uh, to consider the um, uses within that, that area. Um, yeah. So where is that language? So you're to consider the land uses within 500 feet of accommodations used to include the location, square footage, and number of rooms. Existing accommodation uses accommodations uses that have been approved. So I can go through those uh, hotel developments that exist um, within that 500 foot radius around this property. And, uh, but I wanna point out some other things though. Again, here's the property across the street that was rezoned for the residential development. Um, and of course, you have the market sheds up here, retail use. There's lots of restaurants and uh, retail uses along Market Street and even State Street, for that matter, and East Bay Street. Um, and then uh, you've got this office building right here on the southwest side of uh, State and Cumberland, um, or St. Philip's church right here, the large property, graveyard across the street and parking lot for the church. And then the residential area of the French Quarter neighborhood here shown in yellow. Um, this map is really just meant to illustrate the location, the specific location of the hotel. So hotel here with 50 rooms, hotel here with um, 46 rooms in this hotel, 50 rooms in the French Quarter Hotel, um, 31 hotel rooms in the Church Street Inn. And then if you go over here, there's a Market Pavilion Hotel, which has 66 rooms, I believe, and Lodge Alley, which has um, 100, or not, 87 rooms, I'm sorry. A total of 87 rooms. So um, there's a there are a number of hotels in the area, but you also see residential, well, restaurant and retail uses shown with these R designations and office space scattered throughout. This is an office building right here. This is the parking garage for that office building. Um, so it, it it has a mixture of uses in the area, and I'm pointing all this out because I think it's pertinent to the um, the um, condition that you have to find or the, the um, yeah, the condition that you have to find in making a decision about the um, proposed hotel 
The location of the accommodations use will contribute to the maintenance or creation of a diverse mixed use district. And I think um, this is a very mixed use district right now. And the loss of this retail use will not be a detriment to the area by any means. Um, it's not an attractive building. It deserves to be redeveloped for something that's much more attractive. And I think that the addition of the hotel here with the proposed residential development across the street, the other restaurant, office, retail uses in the area, as well as existing hotels will be, uh, will uh, all lead to a more diverse uh, mixed use area. So I feel that they've met that requirement specifically. And then the other requirements uh, that apply, and let me go back to this. So there's also language about the uh, passenger loading zone and whether the proposed use will, um, will uh, significantly increase vehicular traffic in neighborhoods due to the location being adjacent due to location. And I, I think uh, this memo from our traffic and transportation um, employee uh, staff person for the city of Charleston um, states that they don't have any concerns with that given the, the uh, close proximity of East Bay Street and Market Street they don't have any issues with the traffic generation from this proposed use. Uh, significantly increasing vehicular traffic in the neighborhoods and also the guest drop off pickup area, which um, is shown on this ground floor plan right here along State Street with their parking entrance over here uh, has been determined by the city's Department of Traffic transportation to be appropriately located and not be, be an impediment to traffic. So I think they've met all the requirements of the special exception test. And um, and the final thing I'll point out is uh, this statement, which pertains to uh, displacement of storefront retail space. I view the storefront retail space as being a storefront that actually fronts on the street, which is so typical of the commercial spaces downtown area. That's what that was written to preserve or intended to preserve. This is not that type of use because it's a building that sits back behind a parking lot. And uh, so I don't view that as storefront retail. And uh, therefore, I, I think they this condition of the special exception test is, is not. So for all those reasons, I recommend and approval of this request. I think they've met all the requirements of the special exception test. The applicant we want to go into that. Oh, but um, my recommendation is uh, Is there anyone here this evening uh, in opposition to Agenda item B6, that is the hotel that's being requested for approval at 56 State Street. All right, I see no one in opposition. I still think that we need to hear from the applicant, Mr. Wilson, um, about the uh, ways in which uh, your client complies with section 54.220. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. James Wilson with Lovell Bob Dickinson here on behalf of the developer. Um, I have uh, with me uh, Eric Sandy Harrigan, Mr. Scott Fuller, Thank you, uh, Alan Garris, as well as traffic engineers. Answer questions. I don't answer. Uh, um, I do want to. Um, with regard to objections, just uh, because I want to give fair reference to it, uh, the Preservation Society did submit a letter of. Uh, yes, I, I understand that. And I wanted to clarify with Mr. Batchelder that's the only letter in opposition 
that we've received for this application, correct? That's correct. Okay. And I will, uh, and I will that. What I'd like to do is just give you a quick overview of what we think the highlights are. Um, let uh, our team meet with Bill Garris just quickly walk through the floor plan of the uh, of the hotel to see how they satisfy the criteria, and then I'll just try to run through as quickly as I can criteria to make sure we've satisfied the requirements of the board. Um, so Room boutique, boutique hotel that's approved with meeting space and with will have a bar area within the lobby. Uh, no rooftop deck proposed. Gas station now, not an optimal use of this property. One of the important things we think we are doing. Establishing the corner right there. Right now, you have just a curb cut going around the entire property parking lot, and we will restore a property right a corner there for pedestrian use. Which is a pedestrian situation. We'll also, uh, we believe we're going to reduce the number of truck deliveries that you look at the photos that have. Deliveries service. Obviously, it would be we think, a static improvement and much um, make this a much more attractive part of the city. Um, and you'll, you see, actually, that image there are over four lines that we We think this proposal fits with the existing mix of use of this residential. Um, and it's a good transition from the Market Street area moving south down State Street. We met with and talked with the French Quarter Association. Well, as uh, church, which obviously is a significant property uh, in there. Also sat down with the Preservation Society and the Historic Trust. Generally, um, uh, almost everyone has been supportive. Uh, we recognize the Preservation Society's concern, obviously, but we do believe this is appropriate. And let me, uh, uh, our team, just do a quick run through the floor plans. And Mr. Batchelder, if you could take us to the ground floor. Uh, I'm Artemis Jaltov with uh, Bella Garris Architects. Um, as uh, James and Mr. Batchelder already mentioned, the building is located at the corner of Cumberland and State Street. The pedestrian entry is at the corner of the improved, uh, new improved corner of State and Cumberland, which is typical to Charleston. Uh, the vehicular entry is off the Cumberland Street. Again, this is typical to garages along Cumberland Street. First level um, floor plan consists of the lobby and the bar area. The amenity restaurant bar, bar area constitutes less than the allowable 12% area. Um, parking is handled um, 34 spaces on site with a mechanical um, lift. And then there's additional eight spaces in the parking garage to the east property. Uh, Lessening level. Um, Go to the next slide. The mezzanine level shows the required 2,000 square feet of meeting space uh, and per building code, uh, it does not constitute a story. Uh, the levels two and four uh, consists of guest, guest room levels. And you'll see we set back the building from the parking garage to allow natural light uh, that space. And just quickly talk about the, the architecture. The conceptual elevations show the uh, traditional architecture that will be uh, that we believe will fit well with the French Quarter district and would be an improvement to the conditions of the site. Thank you, sir. 
So I'll run us quickly through the criteria specifically to make sure that we hit, hit those, uh, but I'll try to do as quickly as possible, but feel free to interrupt. Anything. Um, uh, we do not, we're not displacing any residential units. We're not displacing any office space, as Mr. Batchelor has already described. We're not displacing uh, existing storefront retail. And uh, actually adding one windows to bringing the property to the uh, street truck. Uh, one of the criteria that's always important is to make sure we're not increasing automobile traffic within a residential district. Uh, Mr. Wallace with traffic and transportation is submit or uh, already addressed that, but uh, generally the property is located obviously very close to the street. <laughs> street. So we have these primary arterial streets uh, up to I-26, Highway 17, um, which is how we expect guests to park the property. Uh, traffic memo that uh, Ms. Buell can describe. Questions that submit as part of sure. Um, the expected to generate roughly about the same amount of traffic as the existing increase. And there's no reason why anybody would really need. And as we get along, we also expect to significantly reduce. That's all described the uh, criteria that uh, the property may help maintain or create a diverse mixed use. Or the mixed use exists. Based on the property, both east and Restaurant uses, I know a cross intersection, office building directly across the street. What works? accommodations Site is, of course, within the accommodations overlay, which is precisely where city council is deemed an appropriate. Overall, the amount of uh, bar and restaurant space will not exceed the 12 station. Yes, drop off and pickup areas have been reviewed by appropriate non traffic. Um, and those will be located directly on State Street or I guess. Um, no loss of off street of on street parking, and uh, we think it's a good efficient management of this vehicle. Properties within the A1 overlay zone, which has a limitation of location. Uh, the hotel will not share building facilities. Operations within the other hotel, public space, which is property was is not a full service hotel. The property will, of course, contribute to the public fund and obviously the see. Was also supposed to consider the following. I'll skip over the ones that we've already touched on. Traffic, uh, we've touched on, but the traffic memo does describe generated and that we are not significantly increasing. And the intersections that are studied around there will continue to operate. Uh, Um, distance from primary arterial A Street, within 500 feet of Those, the proximity of residential districts, the 
the nearest residential district is a little <coughs> further south down uh, down. The Are converting what's uh, accessory uses of the property, the only accessory use. Yeah, the really the guess, so we don't believe back there, as I mentioned, no deck. Parking requirements, two spaces for three rooms, those are met. That's met on site. We'll have at least 34 spaces on site. Employee, employee parking uh, will available. In addition, we will provide Thirty percent employer contribution. Part of the stops located within bicycle storage will also. Uh, yeah, not aware of any uh, industrial toxic uh, hazardous material uses uh, around us. Design intent would be committed to. Uh, the hotel's well located, very convenient to uh, shopping, and uh, uh, Alpha will, of course, also make every effort to uh, all levels reflective of the choice. We also had a developer name, uh, a developer and owner of the I'll just leave that, but obviously we're all thank you, Mr. Wilson. Um anybody else here to speak on behalf of the I know that there are others who could speak if asked, but do does any board member have any questions of the applicant at this time? I just have one. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Um, just to confirm, you said that there will not be a, only because you mentioned that there are shared owners with an adjacent property across the street. Um, there will not be uh, shared facilities between the two between the two businesses. Correct. No shared facilities. Correspondence from the French Quarter Neighborhood Association in Sombrero. So, you had favorable patients with all of those, except for the Preservation Society. Uh, we met, we met directly with the French Quarter. Uh, they, they were very supportive. Um, French Quarter um, said that you know, this works for us. Anybody else have any questions for Mr. Wilson? Um, I I have a question, and and Mr. Wilson, you could address it, or or Mr. Batchelder. Um, I'm reading the letter from the Preservation Society, their position statement, dated June 7, 2021, and it states um, the concern about the. Uh, diverse mixed use district and it states an additional entitled hotel that extended their best drive earlier this year directly across the street at 26 28 Cumberland Street. Is that the property that has been now um, rezoned for residential use? Yes, I, I, I can speak to that. Yeah, Chairman. Um, that the sale of that property did not close until and so in the end of the year, you know, until we knew that that closing actually was going to take, going to take place, we wanted to preserve the existing. We had to go ahead and extend it at the beginning of the year, lest it expire and lose the property. 
extended, but then within the uh, the rezoning. So the owner of that property, even if it made a decision not to build residential, would have to go through another rezoning process and come before this board again to get a uh, to get a, a, an accommodations use approval. I, I do not represent the current uh, current owner. All right, um, and then there was something about industrial use. Does that include the the property itself? Because I know that it, at one point in time functioned as a gas station. I assume you all have done all your all your phase phase one, phase two, if necessary. We have we have environmental phase one site assessments. Action. All right, any other questions? All right, any further discussion? Favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes. The um, application is approved. 56 State Street, the special exception under Section 54-220, unanimous, unanimous approval with the exception of Mr. McKay, who recused himself from this item. Thank you very much. Uh, is that it for you, Mr. Wilson? Okay. All right. All right. Moving right along, number uh, B seven seventy two Clemson Street, Wagner Terrace. Application number two two zero six dash zero seven dash B seven. PMS number 463-07-02-026, request special exception under section 54-110 to allow a vertical extension law to a non-conforming detached accessory building that does not meet the required 60-foot front setback and 25-foot rear setback, zoned SR2, owner applicant Reed Walker, Mr. Batchelder. So this is a residential property in Wagner Terrace and uh, on the corner of Mount Pleasant, Clemson Street. House plate faces Clemson Street and has this shed, one story shed over here that they would like to uh, expand by uh, adding a loft space. In it. Uh, this is the existing shed. More photos. Exterior. exterior, and it appears that uh, from the county records, it's been there since the 1950s, I think, if I remember correctly. Um, survey showing the location. So this is, um, these are the plans showing what they would like to do. Uh, one story building right now, they'd like to add this loft space and uh, adds a little bit of elevation to the existing building. And because it's a non-conforming building that doesn't meet the setback requirements, it's, it's a special exception to vertically extend that non-conforming footprint with additional area, floor area on the inside of the building. These are the images they would like to do. And this is from a neighbor at 66 Clemson, which is just in the south of this property, I believe. Yeah, just in the south. And so our recommendation is for approval. This is a very minor adjustment to the height of the building. And, uh, 
so that it will adversely affect the white near on the adjoining properties. Thank you, Lee. Is there anyone here in opposition to item B772 Clemson Street here tonight? I is the applicant here. Um, see if we have any, any questions for you. Do we have any, any questions for the applicant this evening? Um, no questions and no opposition. Do I hear a motion? To approve. All right, we have a motion to approve. Do I hear a second? All right, motion to approve. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No one is opposed. Um, Mr. Walker, you've received your special exception. Thank you very much. The motion has approved unanimously for B772 Clemson Street. Um, thank you very much. All right, item B8, 24 State Street in the French Quarter, TMS number 458-09-01-120, application number 2206-07-B8, request special exception under section 54-110 to allow a change on the ground floor from a non-conforming -conform retail use to a non-conforming office use with days of operation Monday through Saturday and hours of operation 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. in an SR5 single family residential zone district. Owner 24 State Street, LLC, Ruth Ann Granito, managing member, applicant Metters Architecture, Jeremy Tate, Mr. Batchelor. So this is a residentially zoned property within the French Quarter neighborhood on State Street, just south of Queen. It's had a retail use on the ground floor for many, many years. And uh, the applicant is now requesting your approval to convert that non-conforming retail space into a non-conforming office space, residential zone district. Here's the building. It's a three-story, three-and-a-half-story building. And uh, have a street view image, but uh, the ground floor uh, lends itself to being a non-residential use, maybe it was originally. And so uh, they would like to, uh, oh, there it is, okay. There it is. So you see kind of a storefront type uh, ground floor uh, frontage and uh, floor plan shown here and the proposed floor plan has uh, the office space shown with uh, stairs and laundry space for the residents above. And lots of support from all the neighbors it appears in this immediate area of the property, which is no surprise. And, uh, and so we recommend approval of this change. We feel that it will be equally or more appropriate, which is the standard that the board is to apply to these kinds of requests. Continuing the diversity of mixed uses in the neighborhood. Correct. Um, all right. Um, is there anyone here in opposition to agenda item B8 at 24 State Street? All right, I see no one here in opposition. Um, is the applicant here? Tate, um, just hold on one second. Um, do we have any uh, questions for the applicant or for staff? Is there any parking regulation implicated by this change? I mean, the, the space is so small, there's probably, um, the, the retail requirement is a little higher than office requirement, but on this size space, it's probably the same, uh, so. No impact there. Okay. We'll come back someday. <laughs> just so I just understand, this is only at the ground level. This is That's correct. Back. Thank you. Yeah. Any further questions or anything, Mr. Tate could help you with? All right. Uh, do I hear a motion? Second. All right. Uh, any further discussion? Discussion on 
favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Not opposed. The motion carries, passes unanimously. Uh, your special exception is granted. Yes, that's uh, V8, granted unanimously. All right, agenda item B9, 5 Shepherd Street, East Side, TMS number 459-05-04-069, application number 2206-07-B9, request special exception under section 54-110 to allow one-story addition, kitchen, and HVAC platform that extends a non-conforming 3.2-foot west side setback, seven feet required, Request variance from section 54-301 to allow one-story addition and HVAC platform having a 52% lot occupancy, 50% limitation, existing lot occupancy, 46%. Zone DR-2F, owner Kevin Eberl, applicant Hunter Kennedy, KDS LLC, Mr. Batchelder. Uh, Five Shepherd Street is a residential property in the side neighborhood located here between Hanover and Aiken Street. It um, is an odd property in that the, the building is uh, sort of an unusual building. I don't know the history, but uh, I'm sure it has an interesting history to it. And uh, here's an aerial image showing the building. This would, would be a recent photograph. And then this is a Google Street image from, I think, 2015. Uh, you can see it's in pretty poor condition. I don't even know what it looks like today. I, I assume it looks probably a little bit worse than this today. And so the applicant is uh, proposing to restore this house. And uh, where is it going? I missed that. There they are. OK. So remove some existing additions to the house and replace them with new additions shown here. Here's the AC stand and this new addition. And so those changes require the special exception for the uh, story and HVAC platform to extend that non-conforming west side setback and then a variance to allow those additions to increase the overall lot occupancy building footprint on the, on the lot. And uh, I'm going to zoom right through this. So here are some photographs. It's in pretty rough shape. And um, there was a story in the paper, interesting story in the paper recently about this endeavor. And uh, our drawings um, be a wonderful restoration, I'm sure. And the applicant has uh, letters of support from the basement property owners, neighbors, located here. And uh, so lots of support for this, and we recommend approval of this request. Thank you, Lee. Is there anyone here in opposition to um, item B9 at 5 Shepherd Street? Opposition. Um, do we have any questions for the applicant? Staff. No questions. Um, I hear a motion. Okay. Um, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? None opposed. The motion passes unanimously. The special exception and variance for five Shepherd Street on the east side, item B9 on the agenda passes. Thank you very much. All right, moving on to B10, 271 St. Philip Street, Cannonboro, Elliottboro, TMS number 460-04-04-012, application number 2206-07-B10, request special exception under section 54-110 to extend a non-conforming triplex by increasing the total square footage of conditioned floor area to 2,772 square feet from 1,982 square feet and increasing the total number of bedrooms to eight bedrooms from six bedrooms. Zoned GB, owner is the Allen Coswell Trust, 
applicant AJ Architects, Mr. Batchelder. Now, this is an interesting property. 271 St. Philip Street is a residential property, although it's zoned general business. And uh, so you see it's located at the north end of that section of St. Philip Street that is south of uh, Septima Clark uh, Crosstown Parkway Highway 17. And St. Philip Street right here is um, is basically a dead end street that ends right at the right of way for Highway 17. Uh, commercial zoning, as you can see, includes all of the properties on the west side of St. Philip Street in this block as well as everything to the east, which would extend over to King Street. Uh, a little bit of trivia for you, but that dates back to a, a time when St. Philip Street came further north and uh, was part of the major street network for that area uh, before the Crosstown was constructed. Crosstown construction cut off this street and isolated that section of the neighborhood to the north. Um, it also created some unusual uh, right-of-way boundaries for that uh, road improvement. And this area back here, which is shown in green, part of the highway, this, this SCDOT right-of-way for the Crosstown. This owner, when they purchased 271 St. Philip Street, worked out a, an arrangement with the DOT to purchase this piece of land from them, add it to their property. So they've increased the size of their lot with the addition of that former right of way, which was just basically a throwaway area. It wasn't necessary, it was kind of sitting around this remnant right of a lot that once existed there. And uh, by doing that, they've increased the size of the lot. They've made the current non-conforming use of this property as a triplex a little less non-conforming because the right to have three units is based on the size of the lot. The size of the lot is not quite large enough for three units, but it's gotten a lot closer to that size. So, what they'd like to do with that additional land that they purchased is build a, another unit, another building in the back of the lot, and move the third unit from the main house into that new building at the back of the lot. So in this neighborhood, that has happened a number of times, um, and that, that's been one way of, of um, redeveloping some of these properties because what's happened over time is these houses, the original houses were added on to. They were added on to in ways that were not very sensitive to the historic architecture. And I don't have a good front view of this house, but you can see the piazza of this house is much wider than the house to the south. Now the house to the south was very nicely restored not too many years ago. And so you see the original piazza on that single house. And then you look at this house right here, you see the original house right here and a very wide porch. That porch is totally new, appropriately added a number of years ago and it's in poor condition. So, as part of this effort, uh, my support for this request involves the owners of the property uh, removing that porch and basically decreasing the width of the house uh, back to what it originally would have been and restoring that piazza. And so um, this is a view of the existing house from the cross town. Not that you'd ever see this view because you'd be driving the wrong way on Highway 17 if you did. But this is the best view I could find. And you see that um, piazza over here, and it's really, uh, really inappropriate. 
Most of the other homes on that street look pretty good, but this house is one of the last ones that has been neglected. And, uh, and so this effort will involve uh, restoring the house back to something more character. So the applicant made this application after talking to me and going back and forth with plans. And uh, so here you see the survey showing the existing house and then that additional land back here that was added to the lot. And uh, you see here a proposed footprint. The piazza has been narrowed and restored. And the house back here has actually been narrowed as well in this um, diagram. And uh, so this is the existing floor plan. That's right. This is the existing floor plan. It shows three units in the main in the existing house. This wide piazza and this wide addition back here that was built onto the original single house. And this is the proposed plan. So again, the piazza has been narrowed back to uh, something along the lines of what was originally there. There, the house in the back has been narrowed and the number of units has been reduced from three to two. Then what they would like to do is um, their drawings showing that house. And then what they would like to do is add this two-story structure in the back, which will include a couple bedrooms upstairs, uh, be the third unit. And uh, what all this does is it makes it a little easier to park in the back of the lot. Um, they still won't have all the parking that they need for the three units, I don't believe, but this, this, because this is kind of tight, but uh, maybe you can park five cars back there finished with this. And this would be the new unit built, uh, two stories, uh, two bedrooms up above. They originally were proposing a three story uh, building, and I said, no, that's too much, too much square footage. And we went back and forth and they downsized it. So, um, I think they're, uh, based on my calculations, the lot size has increased by about a third. And they've also, again, added bedrooms in this proposal. So they're increasing the bedroom count from, eight, from six bedrooms up to eight bedrooms total. Um, increasing the total floor area of condition space as, as indicated agenda. But I think they deserve some credit for acquiring that additional land, making the triplex a little less non conforming. And so these kind of um, projects, of course, involve a lot of investment to fix up the, the old house. Uh, and I, 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 I like the fact that they're removing a substantial amount of the piazza and then a sub more substantial amount of the house in the back to help restore that house back to something along the line. So I'm willing to support this, um, this request for the special exception to extend the non-conforming use in this manner because of the changes that they've made to their plans and the, the fact that they did acquire that plan back and enlarge the lot. Thank you, Lee. Uh, the last one of you is here to oppose the other. You're, you're, um, you don't have any opposition. Uh, so um, did we have any opposition in the file? Any letters come in? Oh, and the applicant is here. Um, does any board member have any questions for the applicant or, or for staff on this application? That's item B10. I hear no questions. Does anyone have a motion? All right, we have a motion. We have a second. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? None opposed. Uh, item B10, 271 St. Philip Street, requesting the special exception is uh, passed unanimously. Uh, thank you very much. 
All right, final item on the agenda, B1152 Gibbs Street, Charlestown, MS number 457-11-04-135, application number 2206-07-B11. Request special exception under section 54-110 to allow a two-story addition den bedroom that extends a non-conforming 2.5 feet east side setback, nine feet are required. Request variance from section 54-301 to allow a two-story addition with a 14 foot rear setback, 25 feet are required zoned SR2. Owner, our owners are Peter and Eleanor Lunenberg. Applicant is E.E. E. Fava. Architects, Mr. Batchelder. 52 Gibbs residential properties, Gibbs between Rutledge and Cal Street, shown here. And uh, here's an aerial view of the existing house. <clears throat> and the zoning map showing that building footprint on the lot. And uh, so the applicant uh, first proposed a rear addition to the house. Um, a couple months ago, and I thought it was too much. And I guess maybe a neighbor expressed some concerns about it as well. So the applicants went back to the drawing board, and reduced the overall size of the of the proposed rear addition, which is shown here, and uh, came up with something that uh, uh, the neighbors seem to be uh, happy with. Uh, don't know of any opposition. And uh, basically what they had before was a, a, an addition. I think it went back a little bit further and was wider, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> I felt like that was just too much on this lot, that it was going to impact uh, the neighbors too much. And because uh, you never really, a lot of people don't realize what the building is going to do to their property until it's there. And uh, from experience, I just feel like some of these additions are too too large and impactful for neighbors. And so they did downsize it. And so I, I think that's a good thing. And, and uh, basically elevations here. So existing front and rear. So here's the rear elevation existing right now. And the proposed rear elevation has this two-story addition back here and a one-story porch. Side view, you see the change. Um, and the previous proposal was much larger, much more impactful, I think. But they do have the support of both of the immediate neighbors on either side. Uh, this is uh, um, Christopher, that name at 11 Rutledge, and Keith Meany at 50 Gibbs Street. We, the undersign, have had the opportunity to review the proposed plans. Actually asked it for So I think we have support from the two immediate neighbors and uh, feel like they've met the special exception requirement for the extension of not conforming east side setback variance to allow the um, reduction of the rear setback. So my recommendation is for approval. Thank you, Lee. Um, are you Mr. Lunenberg or Mr. Fava? I'm actually Michael Fribble, work for Okay, thank you. Um, no one is here in opposition for the record. Um, does anybody have any questions for the applicant? Anybody have any questions for Lee? Your motion. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? None opposed. The motion carries, passes unanimously. The special exception and the variance are approved. Thank you very much, sir. Is there any new business? 
none. The motion is in the meeting. <laughs> the meeting is adjourned. <laughs> you don't want to do any new business tonight, Hal? <laughs> Thank you. 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 So we we see good. How you doing? That's the Roman at one. I read about this. I think I'm going to try to We left that. We left that. It's far away. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know what I need to do. So just check approved.